both feel about what how do you feel about uh, negative utilitarian uh, yeah um, you know I sympathize with the idea that that suffering is generally more important than happiness but I philosophically I can't come at negative utilitarianism because I can't imagine that uh, if you had the opportunity to greatly increase happiness without causing any extra suffering at all that wouldn't also be the right thing to do. In fact, I think it would be uh, obligatory to do that. Um, so if that's so, then you can't be a pure negative utilitarian. How do you feel, David? Yeah, so I, think, I think our overriding obligation is to uh, minimize and ultimately phase out uh, uh, suffering. But, and everything else is a bonus. Um, but one thing I think it really is worth stressing that one can be committed to phasing out all forms of suffering without being any kind of utilitarian, whether negative or classical or preference. Uh, indeed, obviously, kind of uh, Buddhism, uh, may the world that have life be delivered from suffering. No one uh, reproached Buddha with saying that the easiest way to get rid of suffering would be to, to wipe out life. And yeah, I think it's really important to stress the diversity of secular and religious uh, traditions that uh, allow us to phase out suffering. It's, uh, when you say that uh, the obligation is to reduce suffering and, and everything is a bonus, are you not prepared to trade off at all? I mean, suppose that, you know, this is one of those crazy examples, of course, but suppose that for having a mild headache for five minutes, you could make uh, a billion people much happier. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be the right thing I, to do? Personally, I would do so, but this is because uh, at the same time as having this nasty headache, I would be anticipating and mentally visualizing these people being, being happier. Mm. Um, uh, but I'm, yes, completely uh, un un undogmatic uh, about this. I think, uh, yeah, as, as, as I said, if, if one is a, a preference utilitarian, Classical utilitarian, uh, all of these are consistent with with, with, with facing out suffering. Um, uh, I mean, I certainly agree that I think mm. you know, that would be mm. an ideal and extremely important objective. Um, I only mm. think it's not it's not the only objective. Of what I'm it's this, this idea that no one was no one is harmed by uh, by not existing. Um, it's also the rather paradoxical, some people, you know, if you say negative utilitarianism, many people will think, well, would you destroy the world? To, um, but uh, strictly speaking, if one is a classical utilitarian, one seems obliged to optimize matter and energy for, for pure bliss and uh, initiate some kind of utilitarian shockwave that would obliterate all forms of complex life, civilization, uh, intellect as we understand it. It's, uh, if you like, a, a counterintuitive implication of a classical utilitarian ethic, or at least it would seem to be. I'm not sure what, I don't know that I understand the concept of this uh, oh. blissful shockwave which seems to be independent of there being conscious beings. Right, well, is it, this is it. If one can, uh, let's say, isolate the molecular structure of pure bliss, then in theory, if one is a a classical utilitarian, shouldn't we, one be trying to propagate it throughout uh, 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 the universe? Um, but, but when you say the molecular structure, I'm assuming that that requires a mind. I'm assuming that whatever the molecular structure is, it's instantiated in minds. Uh, currently, yes. So if you look at the, the human mind-brain, our kind of ultimate hedonic hotspots are a couple of... Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, cubic uh, centimeters scaling up from, from a rat. But uh, electrode studies suggest that vast areas of the human mind brain aren't actually directly implicated in hedonic tone at all. Um, and yeah, I, I, obviously I'm making a number of philosophical assumptions here, but all of that tissue, just as all of the matter and energy in this room could in theory, at least by an advanced intelligence, be converted into kind of pure orgasmic bliss. And on the face of it, at any rate, if one is a classical utilitarian, uh, one is obliged to constantly you know, keep on in, uh, increasing pure bliss. As far oh, as I would be if one could, right? I mean, well, this is, this is, uh, this, it's, 
yeah. Um, if one is if one is a negative utilitarian, and we have phased out the biology of of suffering, then in one sense all our ethical obligations have been discharged. Whereas if one is a classical utilitarian, even if you have an advanced civilization, gradients of intelligent bliss and so on, one is apparently you know obliged to press this uh, uh, this button for just pure orgasmic bliss, uh, or at least on the face of it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, maybe. I mean, it's uh, exactly what that would be is is difficult to work out. And yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, but but I guess those implications are possible. But uh, yes, in today's world, this is perhaps a rather remote prospect. But uh, yes, given that, yeah. I mean, as you know, some. Uh, transhumanists and uh, even now some billionaires are worried about the prospect of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, these, these issues are not as far far fetched as they might once have seen. Right. Uh, yeah, um, that's true. And they talk, you know, if you talk about maybe it's more uh, efficient to have mm -hmm. conscious consciousness in artificial intelligence rather than than in biological beings like us. Um, that's that's possible, I suppose, at some stage, and, and I'm not um, obviously. I'm, you know, from my work on animals, I'm not a speciesist, so yeah. in that sense, um, it's not important to me that it be biological human beings who experience the happiness. Um, uh, if there are, if you can have conscious machines um, that experience that happiness and that do it better than we do, then I don't have any in principle objection to that. Yes, I mean, I'm personally still skeptical about uh, 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 digital sentience, but uh, uh -huh. yeah, one could be uh, completely wrong. <laughs> right. uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, t to my mind, yeah, aiming not to maximize bliss, but to, uh, to, to ratchet up hedonic set points seems, to, to my mind, at least one way forward, because it doesn't ask people to change their existing values and preference architecture, and it's you know, consistent with high functioning well-being. Uh, but uh, that's presumably a much more long-term project than in, you know, global poverty. Um, yeah, and that's, I guess, one of the questions is, um, there are these futuristic possibilities, which I think are really interesting philosophically to discuss. Um, but, but there is a question about to what extent our priorities should be related to them and to what extent they should be related to the here and now, to what we can achieve in areas like global poverty or reducing the suffering of animals. Yes, I, I, I said I think something like universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling, it's not the really hot button issue of genetic engineering, though some people of course would, would confuse it, uh, and it's also extremely effective. I don't know what your, your, your thoughts are there. I mean, it's actually, it, pre-implantation genetic screening is more commonly used now, apparently, in India and China than it is in the West, uh, unfortunately. To get rid of girls. Uh, well, unfortunately, yeah. yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, that would be one way to, at least in principle, ratchet up hedonic set points without the hot-button issue of, of genetic Mm -hmm. um, and when you say it's cost effective, um, I mean it's it's not cheap, right? Because you have to use in vitro fertilization yeah. to, to get these embryos before you implant them, mm -hmm. and then you have to screen them. Um, and so, in order for that cost to be worthwhile, you have to have a pretty good sense of how the selection would reduce suffering. Yes, I mean, I mean something like depression. For, I mean, at the moment. Uh, 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 prospective children aren't screened for genes predisposing to depression, whereas they would be for something like cystic fibrosis. But in in narrowly economic terms, if one thinks of the burden of low mood and depression to the economy, obviously it's difficult precisely to quantify. But if, if let's say, uh, pre-implantation genetic screening were pretty much the norm, it would pick up yeah, the standard you know, nasty well-known genetic diseases. Um, in terms of low mood, depression, I think there would be economic benefits there too. But it's, I suppose the education factor is harder to, to quantify in that one doesn't need a specialist genetic expert to counsel prospective parents that their kid would be better off without 
uh, cystic fibrosis, but on something like you know hedonic set points or something mm. like that, it's. Uh, I mean, do we do we do we already have the genetic knowledge to screen out depression, for example? Or, I mean, I thought um, there are a number of genes now that are associated with a high or a low hedonic set point. Uh, something like you know the COMPS gene, two alleles, one high, one low hedonic set point. Uh, uh, ADA 2B, uh, a deletion variant associated with either optimism or pessimism. But of course, if you start having uh, uh, disorders that are multifactorial, you start requiring much more expertise than if you're simply screening for the obvious stuff. Right. But um, yeah, as, as, as you know, so much evidence is, is there that uh, the, the hedonic treadmill Rhymes uh, and yeah, this this studies. I think I'm planning to cite one in the talk. Just asking people for just raw data, percentage of people internationally describing themselves as very happy. A few years ago, Indonesia, India, and Mexico, completely unadjusted, of course, for all the other factors too. And yeah, well, I wouldn't want to tell a mother with a dying or starving child that a hedonic set point needs recalibrating but uh, yeah I think ultimately if we are going to phase out involuntary suffering we're going to have to tackle its genetic biological roots right no I yeah. mean I, I'm not obviously yeah. I'm you know, not at yeah. all yeah. opposed to that I'm just yeah. um, wondering in, in terms of, of how much more knowledge we still need or, mm. or how much how much say you know serious long-term treatment resistant depression we could eliminate on the basis of genetic screening now, and perhaps then, you know, if we put more research effort into that, how much we could eliminate in 10 or 20 years. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this, this whole kind of time scales thing. Should EAs be focused on the next five years, 50 years, mm -hmm. 500 million years, or, 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 or what have you? There doesn't seem to be a, a consensus here. Um, no. But, uh, no, I mean, for me, the answer to that is clear, and that is that um, any moment of existence counts the same, whether it's mm. tomorrow or, or in a million years. Um, but the uncertainty factor, of course, yeah. mm. starts to cut in when you talk about long time frames. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I suppose people's uh, objection, if you start talking about pre-implantation screening, is you know e experimentation. But but given that any child is a genetic experiment. Uh, that is decisive. Yeah, and I mean, one of the interesting things about that is that um, it would vary from country to country, but at least in the United States, I think if it were to develop on a free enterprise basis, essentially, uh, it's not that likely that legislation would be passed to stop it. Whereas in some other countries, you, you know, the assumption would be that this is already regulated and you couldn't do it unless it was approved by some regulatory authority. Yeah. But in the United States, and I suppose a number of other countries, um, the inertia would run the other way. The inertia would run to, to let it develop um, unless there was an overpowering reaction that said it had to be stopped. Yes, I suppose China is the big unknown here, that they don't have the historical memory that uh, uh, we do in, in the West. Yeah. Um, but one's worry is that instead of, for example, focusing on something like uh, low mood or depression, they would be trying to screen for uh, in intelligence, which I think is much, much harder to do as well as morally problematic. Um, um, yeah, I'm interested that you think that's morally problematic because I would have thought you know, you, you'd be optimistic that if you actually have more intelligent people, they will produce solutions to some of these problems. They will help us to get rid of suffering. I should have qualified that is that my assumption is that as well as uh, there's a lot of these as sort of genes associate, associated with IQ would also be associated with, uh, with, with AQ in the sense of Asperger's uh -huh. quotient and you know existing IQ tests are so flawed and mind blind in many cases designed by Asperger's or Asperger's that it would mix. Sorry, that's a rather simplistic way of putting, of, of putting it. But uh, I think uh, a post-human conception of, of what intelligence is would be unimaginably richer than today. And uh, so, yes, I'm rather skeptical of, 
of our ability yet to uh, uh, for genetic screening for intelligence. Eventually, yes. Mm. Uh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious as to what sort of reaction you've had to the hedonic imperative and to the idea of abolishing suffering. I mean, you, you've had that idea out there. Uh, Yes, I mean, uh, this is it. As, you know, the, the people who get in contact are almost by definition un, uh, unrepresentative. Uh, a small minority of people extremely enthusiastic. Uh, a small minority of people very hostile. Most people presumably uh, indifferent. But I think the critical thing is, is time scales in that just as it can be almost cruel to tell people that science is going to find a cure for aging sometime after you're dead, I think most people would assume, well, it may happen one day, but uh, I won't benefit from it. Um, it's, uh, as I said, personally, I think the, yeah, the, the real imperative is to phase out involuntary suffering, but for purely technical reasons, the pleasure principle plus genetic engineering, uh, I do yeah, take very seriously the possibility that post-humans will be animated by not just sort of gradients of well-being, but gradients of bliss that are orders of magnitude richer than anything accessible today. Um, there's a bit of a t tension here in one sense, in that, uh, yeah, I could, one assumes posterity will be far wiser than us, and they would presumably regard something like negative utilitarianism as some depressive pathology, and they, and they could be right. I mean, it's, I suppose when one is talking about the future, it's very easy to some kind of disguised autobiography. And if you know different futurists and their backgrounds, in many cases, you can see their conception of the future being refracted through their own life history, and that if I were, a Toby Ord, for example, as we were touching on earlier, or an Anders Sandberg, who, as he puts it, I do have a ridiculously high hedonic set point. My conception of what the future was like and what we ought to be doing would be different. Uh, I take it that you're naturally an optimist, I would guess. Uh, I think that's probably true, yeah. yes. Um, mm. you know, uh, I hope a reasonably realistic optimist. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I... I I think we, we are making progress over time. Um, uh, you might know, I sort of suggested that uh, about 30, more than 30 years ago in the expanding circle. Um, and I was pleased to see Stephen Pinker uh, take that idea up and put a lot more um, substance to it, a lot more research into it in Better Angels of Our Nature. So um, I, feel, I feel there's some, some basis for that optimism. I hope I just on camera and a long term fan. I hope I don't come across as too starstruck, but of course, uh, uh, it, yes, as I said, as I said it's uh, uh, easy to think in the great uh, scheme of things, one, you know, one can't possibly uh, make any difference. But uh, yeah, I think both on me and so many people, your, your work has. So yeah, uh, just <laughs> appreciation on camera. Thank you. No, no, it's. Uh, yeah. um, I might ask, um, there will be some discussion about like uh, potential risks to civilization. How do you view the importance of future lives um, that, you know, that are going to live compared to lives today? Um, and also, would you like to just talk about like uh, what you think the, the biggest risks are in the near medium term? So let's say over the next hundred years. Um. So, uh, uh, as I said, I think as, as far as thinking about future lives as compared to today, I mean, I think they have equal, equal worth, equal value. Um, the happiness of a being in 100 years is neither to be given greater weight nor less weight than, than that of somebody now. Um, but it is hard to predict how different it will be um, in, in various ways. Uh, in terms of the greater risk, the greatest risks to that, uh, you know, I grew up in a generation that, that was worried a lot about nuclear war. Um, and people worry less about that now, but I think that, that is, there's still some risk of that, um, particularly with nuclear proliferation. Um, hopefully not an extinction risk, but uh, it's not impossible. Um, pandemics, I suppose, I would see as, as possible risks as well. Um, they would 
that seem to me to be the, the major ones. And, and you know, climate change obviously is, a, is a, I think, a huge problem. Again, whether it really gets to being an existential risk, I don't know, but certainly a risk to the quality of life of um, beings on this planet in 100 years seems to me to be pretty significant. Yes, I, uh, I quite pessimistic about our chances of uh, avoiding nuclear war this century. Uh, there is nuclear proliferation, I and mean, the history suggests that weapon, you know, we currently spend what is it about one and a half trillion dollars each year on weaponry. The chances are it's uh, going to be used. Uh, I'm skeptical it's going to lead to human extinction, but yeah, tens, hundreds of millions of of casualties, unimaginable horror. Um, uh, but I, I talk of risks suggests that we've got something that's really good and we're in danger of losing it, but uh, something like uh, yeah, the, the horror of factory farming, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in that sense, um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that should be one off. I mean, it, it's it, 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 that that's the uh, the issue that I think uh, uh, it's it's clearest what we should be doing. So many moral issues. There are so many complexities on the one hand or the other hand. Whereas something like yeah, industrialized animal abuse. It's so straightforward. What should should be doing? Uh, closing uh, uh, factory farms and slaughterhouses. Um, Sorry, then. Yes, no, no, I, agree. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with that, actually. Yeah, it is yeah. one of the ones that's less complicated because there isn't really, you know, a, a cost to that. I mean, there are, there are obvious benefits in reduction of suffering of animals, but there are also benefits in terms of climate change and environmental benefits. And uh, even the, uh, the, the lowly paid workers who work in those places have miserable lives with, uh, with, with health problems, uh, very likely. So, so that does seem to be an all round win situation. And it, it's, it's good to see that opinion is coming around that, um, you know, the New York Times had an editorial just a week or so ago, very strong against factory farming. Yes, um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's, it's, I see more and more agreement coming to that, but that doesn't mean that it's actually about to change because people are still buying its products. Yes. What are your thoughts on the whole kind of vegetarianism vegan issue, because I think yeah, we can agree that it's sort of long-term ideal uh, vegan. Where do you stand uh, on, I mean, there are some, I mean, there are some people one knows are just never going to go vegan, but will go vegetarian. Is it, what, what line do you take there? Is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my um, thing, I think the urgent thing to do is to reduce the consumption of animal products. Mm -hmm. And um, although, of course, at a personal level, you will admire people who who are vegan and you won't admire people who say, oh, well, I don't eat meat on Mondays anymore. Um, but in fact, uh, probably we can do more to reduce animal suffering and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by encouraging tens of millions of people to stop eating meat on Mondays or Fridays or whatever, you know, at least one day a week, um, than we can by doubling or tripling or quadrupling the number of vegans around. So um, I do think that is, it's an important priority to just reduce meat consumption. Yes. Mm. Uh, I should say, I think, you know, the, the, the vegans are playing an important role in pushing that boundary and therefore leading to the development of more products that are suitable for vegans and showing that you can be healthy and vital and energetic on a vegan diet. So I, I do think it's important that there are vegans. I don't want to give the impression that it's not important. But um, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't just promote that uh, and say, you know, everybody should stop eating animal products altogether. I think we should also focus on the larger mass of people and get them to cut out their meat, cut down their meat consumption. Yes, I mean, certainly if one uh, uh, shuts and outlaws factory farms and slaughterhouses, okay, that's not necessarily uh, strict veganism or the end of all forms of I mean, animal exploitation, but a massive reduction in severe and readily avoidable suffering. So, yep. yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. And one thing I'll add, since we're, if we're talking about numbers, is that you, know, you still come across these people who say, oh, I don't eat red meat. Um, and that seems exactly, in terms of numbers, the, the wrong decision to make. If there's one kind of meat they should give up, it, it should be chicken, because that's you know, 
well, so many more animals are involved, of course, because they're smaller. Um, but also, I think the suffering of factory farmed chickens is, is much greater than that of cows. Um, so I think there is a serious, yes. serious problem with people saying, yes. I don't eat red meat. Yes. It's, uh, No, I, mean, I, I said sometimes I, I wonder how we will explain what we did to our grandchildren. Uh, it's, yeah, I'm looking back on the current era, but uh, uh, yes, um, it sort of contributes to my, my very dark view of the world. But uh, uh -huh. yeah, it's, if one becomes too pessimistic, one just sinks into fatalism and despair, which doesn't do anyone any It doesn't good. achieve anything, that's right. Yeah. And in that, sense, yeah. in that sense, you could regard you know, optimism, whether you are naturally optimistic or pessimistic, you could regard being somewhat optimistic as, as, a, as a positive strategy. People who are oh, somewhat think, optimistic yes. are likely yeah. to do more good than those who are not. No, I mean, if you look generally at, at, at the world, it's the optimists or the people with strong egos who do most good. We're having an interesting conversation, like on the during this online panel of Brian Tomasek and uh, Andreas Emil Gomson, and yeah. So what I was found interesting was valence research, and research into what it really means, uh, whether it's a, a like a physics signature or if it's a an emergent biochemical signature. What is it? What is if we had a real understanding about the underlying uh, properties of bliss and suffering? then wouldn't that be a good thing? Is it worth researching this fundamental feature? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, um, what, if at all possible, one wants, particularly at an EA event, to avoid going into a long discussion on the metaphysics of mind, yet to some extent I suppose it's inevitable because, certainly personally I'm, uh, extremely sceptical digital sentience is possible that, you know, what if one is catastrophically wrong? One thinks of, you know, the Cartesians uh, dissecting live dogs and that their distressed vocalizations were mere, merely mechanical. Um, Brian Thomasig, for example, as you know, believes that video game characters, who I slaughter in great abundance, actually can in the rudimentary sense suffer it is important we get the metaphysics of mind right, but um, so. But anyway, back focusing on your, your 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 question though, I think all one really needs to do is understand the necessary and specific physical conditions for each of our core emotions, and if one does that, uh, and one prevents their occurrence, then suffering, as far as I can tell becomes physically impossible. That yes, people are upset or anxious or depressed about countless different things thanks to, thanks to generative syntax and the projections from the limbic system to the cortex. But the actual roots and the basis of uh, uh, emotion may well be quite simple and extraordinarily ancient and, and won't entail solving the mind-body problem. I don't know what your... Well, I think there's many interesting issues that you raise there, but just to pick up on the one about emotions, I guess what a lot of people are going to say here is you're going to try to somehow eliminate the emotions that lead to suffering. Um, aren't you going to eliminate the emotions that lead to some of the deepest, richest, positive experiences that people have? Uh, uh, how do you answer that objection? Well, it's, I suppose it, it helps if one can point to concrete case studies and uh, when I give, if I express permission, uh, Anders Sandberg, I don't know if you know Anders from the FHI in Oxford, someone who is socially responsible, focused on uh, issues of risk, but as he says, incredibly high hedonic set point. He bounced up to me six months ago just saying he'd just had the worst day of his life. He had a streaming cold, but of course he was full of zest for life. and. What seems to be critical to retaining social responsibility and intellectual insight isn't one's absolute point on the hedonic scale, um, but re retaining informational sensitivity. And of course, there are so many people today who are uh, 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 depressive. And before one goes into the really exotic transhumanist stuff of radiance of super happiness, look at the hedonic outliers, the basis of 
hedonic tones there and see how well it can be be, be replicated. Um, be my, uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's an interesting. Yes, if, if 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 we can get to know and point to living examples mm. of people who have uh, at least dramatically less suffering while still experiencing the positives, um, I think that'd be good. Yes. The the other question that came up because you mentioned Brian Thomas uh, is of course. Um, are we going to be able to answer questions about how far suffering is present as we move to very different orders of beings, in particular invertebrates and other insects, or so invertebrates and insects, in particular insects, I should say, because clearly I think some invertebrates, like the octopus, clearly are sentient. I don't have any doubt about that. Um, but uh, if we were really convinced that insects can suffer in ways that are as significant as human or vertebrate animal suffering, um, that would transform the way we live it in many different ways. Um, perhaps especially in a country like Australia, where you know it's, it's winter here now, but there would be a lot more insects around annoying you, perhaps, if it was summer. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, do you think we're, we're going to be able to actually answer those questions as to uh, whether there is suffering in a fly or an ant? Um, it's the same with the question of, of you know, the philosopher's sceptical problem of other minds. Um, uh, some people say it's, in, it's insoluble. In the case of other vertebrates, I think it, it would be possible to solve it by uh, doing a kind of thalmic bridge of the equivalent of a Vulcan mind meld. Uh, it's going to be harder something to do something like this for... Uh, insects, and yet, you know, if you look at something like the flatworm with their sort of, uh, opioid and uh, dopamine systems, I think it's, it, well, I would say we should strongly suspect the unpleasant experiences there. What we don't know is whether it amounts to suffering. I mean, just as one withdraws one's hand from a hot stone sometimes before one experiences the searing Pain. It may well be the case that one's peripheral ganglia actually experience some nasty, sharp pain that is just not accessible to the central nervous system. But I'd always assumed, at least before uh, Brian discussed the subject, that uh, insect well-being and vertebrate well-being would be something for uh, uh, successors with utopian technology. Uh, right. it's, it's, it's not, I mean, as I said, it's not clear this is the case with the advent of CRISPR and gene drives, as you know, something that, you know, proposals to genetically engineer the, uh, the mosquito population. But um, my assumption would be that we start with, with higher vertebrates and work our way down, in inverted commas, the apologies, I don't think there are any biologists here, <laughs> uh, uh, down the phylogenetic tree, across. Across, across the phylogenetic uh, 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 tree. But... I, we, Brian is yeah quite admirable. He's he won't be deterred by ridicule or anything. Right. Like that. Yeah, so no, I think it's, it's good yeah. that people are putting out for, able to put out these ideas and yes. and get them discussed. Uh, although I, I'm inclined to agree that I think the, the solution is some way away. All right. Well, yeah. Um, I guess we're going to be bringing people in. If there's any like a you know uh, thirty second concluding remarks you want to make at this time, it's probably okay to do that. Uh, well, no, let me just say it's been a pleasure to, to have the, the conversation and uh, look at a range of different issues, and um, I'm sure they're going to be interesting issues for people to talk about, and, uh, and I hope other people watching this will want to take them up and make further progress with them. Uh, yes, well, uh, thank you, Adam, and thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, fantastic being able to chat. <laughs> thank you. Right. Really appreciate it. Much appreciated, uh, yeah. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> no. I smile now. You're <laughs>